Good evening, everybody. My name is Miss Reed. I'm the founder of DamnDaddy.com, where daddy issues drive discussion. And tonight we're in our final meeting in the discussion room for 2017, and it's called New Beginnings. We have the pleasure of having Tiara Nicole join us this evening and tell us about some of the new beginnings she has in her life and her plans for 2018. So, Tiara, would you mind introducing yourself to our guest this evening? Absolutely. Hello, everyone. I am very excited to be here. Um, I have had my share of daddy issues, and some of which I'm still learning to unpack, um, but I'm very excited to be um, turning over a new leaf and to discuss that with you all, uh, because about six years ago, I swore up and down I would never speak to my father again, and actually this past Saturday, I went out to dinner with him, and we had a great time, so it's definitely possible, and never say never. Um, but I'm sure we'll get into some of that as well. You can okay, so I'm I'm glad you went right into it. Have you have you have something else you want to share first? Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say I'm on Instagram at Tierra Nicole ten eleven. Um, it's my my name and my birthday, so you can't forget my birthday. Um, but definitely make sure you follow me. I have all types of motivational posts and and inspiration on a daily basis. Okay, yeah, I, I and I told you, I see your Nicole's Nuggets all the time, and I'm like, yeah, Absolutely. that identifies with me. Um, so what I was going to say that you brought up is that you decided at 20 years old, you swore up and down you would never speak to your dad again. What right. changed um, that made you want to never speak to him again? So tell me a little bit about your relationship with your dad before you had that conversation at 20 years old. Absolutely. So um, I've always known who my father was. That was never my story. Um, and I do resonate with people who grew up not knowing them. And I understand it's a different struggle. I always knew who my father was. My issue with my father was there was a lot of back and forth and a lot of inconsistency. And I felt like the moments where I needed him most, he wasn't there. And that began to create a lot of open wounds. And every time I would try to heal that open wound, he would come in and make it worse. And I, can't, I felt like at 20, I decided that I can't heal this wound if it keeps getting picked at every time I look up. And that's really how I looked at it. And for the longest, I really felt like it was a really healthy decision. Um, I think it was a healthy decision for where I was at that point because it gave me time to process it and to heal it. But at 20, and it was actually my 20th birthday, which was the funny part, um, we had been in an email exchange, um, a very lengthy email exchange. And he said to me, I shouldn't have to earn your love. I'm your father. You should just give it to me. And I felt mm. like I don't give out love just because of your title. I feel like love is an action word. So if you don't want to earn my love, and I feel like you should, we have nothing more to discuss at that point. Um, so I really was just like, you know, I don't think I want to speak to you. Um, he's always been open and eager and interested in um, rekindling. And I'm just like, meh. Good. That's so interesting that you say, um, I don't give love based on a title. I think that I shared with you before that we have similar parallels in our experience and, um, I think that a lot of absent parents, because I won't, I won't stigmatize men alone in this. A lot of absent parents feel like the title designates them um, obligation or entitlement to love and emotions from children, and I think that's unfair. Especially, you know, like what you said, and similar to my experience, if you are inconsistent presence in my life, I don't know you well enough to love you. All I know of you is abandonment or disappointment or being set up to for excitement only to, to be dropped down and, and, and feeling uh, failed and let down. So I like that you, you told him, you know, I don't I don't give out love or dish out love based on a title. Um, and I've come to realize in the conversations that I've had with other people, friends, family member or in the discussion room that those interactions with our fathers carry over into other relationships and how we have a no-nonsense attitude for anybody who shows up expecting to be loved without putting in the work. Absolutely. And the funniest thing, so now I can say this now that I'm 26 and I've done 
the unpackaging, I now see that those abandonment issues cause me to react in one of two ways in every relationship, whether romantic, friendships, family relationships. I've either clung for, cling to them for dear life or push them away out of fear of you're going to leave anyway. So let me be the first to make that decision. And, and that's so interesting that you said that because the last guest that I had here in a discussion room, and I'm sorry to cut you off, but just the exact same language, like the very exact same language. I was talking with um, Valerie Rivera, who is the founder of Val's Vice. She's a dating coach. And we were talking about the abandonment spectrum and how people either cling or push away. So I think that, you know, for you to use the exact same language is just more proof to me and more support that, you know, this, this is not just a coincidence here. Correct. Absolutely. And I think once I came to that realization, um, I realized, A, I need to heal from these issues that his back and forth has caused. And B, I need to figure out how to not be that person. So within um, dating relationships and with even friends, um, friendships, I'm being, now that I'm aware of it, I can work towards being better about it. Um, but one of the things that was a part of the decision-making process for ending our relationship when I was when I was 20 was I really was I was from the perspective of if I wouldn't let a man do this to me, if I wouldn't allow someone I'm dating to go back and forth and pick and choose when you want to be around and just waiting for me to have open arms just because you're ready to be in my life, if I wouldn't accept that from someone I just met, why would I accept that from the person who made a decision to create me? And I just don't feel like it's fair to say, simply because you're my father, I should tolerate abuse. I just <laughs> Call a spade a spade, because that's exactly what it is, emotional abuse. Absolutely. And you know what's interesting to me? I like that you characterized it uh, or categorized it rather. And if I wouldn't have accepted this from this outsider, why should I accept it from you? I think before creating this platform, I received a lot of flack from my uh, female friends because I felt like, you know, I'm not dating you. You don't owe me nothing but genuine friendship. And if you can't communicate with me and it ain't nothing extra going on between us, that would cause you to have reason to avoid communicating with me. We can't be friends. And I think that sometimes, you know, people can see that easier in romantic relationships, but it does oftentimes spill over into platonic friendships. Uh, you know, you just, people want you to be okay with the, them treating you any old kind of way. Um, and, I, and I just, I really appreciate how you categorize that. Like, no, these strangers on the street don't get to treat me that way. And you, as the person who chose to, to bring life into me, definitely don't get to treat me that way. Absolutely. And like you said, I think it's so often we see daddy issues and we recognize it in our romantic lives. But how often are we looking at it at our other relationships in our lives as well? Um, I had to have an honest conversation with myself and say, hey, listen, you're expecting the world from everyone. But... What I had to learn was the reason my expectations were so high of my friends was because I wasn't loving myself. And mm -hmm. so I needed your love to survive. I needed it like I needed air because I wasn't giving it to myself first. But the more I learned to love myself and the more I've learned to get through some of those issues, now we, our friendships can go through busy spells. Our friendships can go through temper tantrums. Our friendships can go through silence or whatever the case without me feeling like, nope, that's it. We can't be friends anymore because I've done the healing for myself and I've learned to be at peace with, even if I am by myself, it's okay. Everything else is a bonus. So with what I heard you say just now is that you did the work and you realized that at some point you were surviving off the love of your friends. You have a book called 23 and Finally Loving Me. Yeah. Tell me how you came to have that specific title for your book and what took place up to age 23 that, that caused you to have this breaking point or this building point. Absolutely. So um, the 23 comes in because it was started on my 23rd birthday. 
um, I realized that I didn't love myself. I realized that I didn't have genuine goals for myself. I had just ended a long-term relationship with the person I thought I was going to marry. Um, and we were actually pretty darn close to engaged at that point. We had just moved out of state together. Um, so I was in a new town, freshly broken up uh, from a relationship that I expected to just be there for the rest of my life. And I remember a conversation with him and he, we were on the phone and he said, what are your goals in life? And I was like, what do you mean? You know the answer to that question. I want to get married and I want to have kids. Those are my goals in life. And he was like, do you have goals that don't involve someone else? Mm. I was like, no. And it really, it challenged me. So we weren't even, at, we were in the tail end of the breakup at that point. Um, but I sat down and I said, well, you need to get some goals because this marriage that you thought was around the corner ain't happening. And subsequently, kids that you thought were around the corner aren't happening either. So um, on my 23rd birthday, I committed to spending the next year focused on growth in every area of my life. This book did not start as a book. It started as a journal. And I knew I needed to heal from my daddy issues. I needed to heal from my depression. I needed to heal from my suicidal thoughts and um, just low self-esteem and financial struggles. And just, I literally did the work. And I challenged myself and I thought about it. And it's so often that we carry around baggage that we don't even realize that we have on our shoulders. And we, every day, if someone asks you, how are you doing? Your answer is probably fine or I'm good. I would say that, but then go home at night and cry my heart out and write five, six pages a night, just processing and dealing with everything that was all of my baggage. And I unpacked it one thing at a time. So at the end of the, the year, um, uh, I want to say about a year after that, um, I was in a church group and we have classes at my church. And one of the ladies caught up and said that her daughter was dealing with suicidal attempts and she just wanted us to pray for her daughter. After the class, I went up to her, I went up to her and said, you know, I've struggled with suicide and depression. And if you need anything, just let me know. About a week or two later, she called me and she said that her daughter had been date raped and it had triggered her suicidal attempt and to the point where her daughter had to be hospitalized as well. Mm -hmm. And the reason she called was because she didn't know how to communicate with her daughter and she felt like everything that she was trying to do to help was making things worse. And so in that conversation, I was explaining to her, I said, you know, these are the things I wish my mother would have done or would have said. Or this is what I would have been trying to communicate when I couldn't. And so just trying to translate that information because I had been there, I realized that the struggles that I've gone through in life are now worth it because I was able to help somebody with their struggles as well. And it was in that moment that I realized, like, this needs to be a book and it needs to go out. Um, and even after that conversation, she called me back a week later. She was like, you know, I had to go apologize to my daughter because I didn't realize what I was saying when I said X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. You know, even something as simple. I was like, ask her what she wants. Don't offer any advice. Don't tell her what to do. Ask her, what do you want from me? Because had my mother asked me, I would have said I want to lay in bed and watch movies all day. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to think about it. I just want to watch movies. Her, her daughter's answer was, I want to go shopping with my mom. And that's what they did. They she took the day off from work and went shopping with her daughter. And just being able to express what her daughter probably couldn't at that time, I felt like my being able to be transparent with my struggles is going to help someone. And so that's what kind of prompted the idea of publishing this book. And then it still took about a year and some change to feel confident enough in my voice to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to risk it all. I'm going to put everything out there in hopes of helping someone. That's a beautiful story. Um, I don't know if I've ever shared this in the discussion room, but I do know that I have said throughout my platform that I, I've been the receiver of many people's stories. And uh, 
a few of them involve people uh, wanting to commit suicide. And this is way before I worked in mental health. I was still working as a, a college prep program counselor at that time, two different cities, two different um, youth. But I like that you said that your experiences gave you the language to communicate with that young, with that mother, what her daughter was unable to communicate with her at that time. And for me, I had not ever known, you know, what I'm supposed to do with this. I'm 13 and my neighbor, we're both new to the city, around the corner tells me she was raped in the city she used to live in. And I'm like, well, mom, what do we do? Because we don't know this person. We don't know anything about her past life. We can't help her prosecute. We don't know what her mom has done or has not done. And she said, just be there. Just listen to that person. And throughout my life, I continue to be the receiver of that type of information. And, you know, I just, I just try to be that, the receiver. And, and I don't do anything or say anything unless I'm asked to. I've been fortunate enough um, to receive formal training now on what to do when people are feeling suicidal. But I think it's absolutely um, imperative that when you are able to empathize with someone that you do, because so many of us go through life feeling alone, just like when you said, um, people go through the day asking you, how, how are you? And you say, I'm okay, or I'm fine. I remember being in high school, learning French, and my French teacher was Haitian. And she said, Americans lie. She said, Americans lie. And in, in Haiti, when we speak the French language, we don't lie. If someone says, how are you? You don't say, I'm fine, I'm good. If you're not fine, you're not good. Tell the truth. So I remember learning, and I don't speak French fluently. Whatever little bit of French I learned, I think that message stood out to me more than anything in the French language because it, it made me be intense about that. When people are asking me how I'm feeling, I try my hardest to be more honest about that. You know, even if I say I'm making it, that lets you know that I'm not good, but I'm not allowing whatever is bothering me to keep me down. Uh, so, you know, that, that's what I took away from what you said just now, is that, you know, Americans lie. It just made me, took me back to being 14 years old. We should not tell people we're okay, we're fine. I think one of my Facebook friends said that. He said, when your family's asking you over the holidays, how are you feeling? Please don't lie. Because I think a lot of times, and I know this is my story personally, I have a terrible habit of overthinking. Like one of my uncles didn't call me on my birthday and I'm like, oh mom, he didn't call me because yesterday I called his mom and I asked her for X, Y, Z and I don't normally talk to his mom so he probably felt disrespected. And then my uncle called me and he was like, oh, I'm moving and I got busy moving out yesterday. I didn't forget about you. Right. You know, he called me the next day, maybe two or three minutes, not even a whole five minutes, two or three minutes after I had let that statement leave my mouth. He didn't even know. He didn't even know anything about what I was feeling, you know, that was preventing him from having called me on my birthday. So I think a lot of times we, we overthink things when we should just be honest with the people in our lives about how we're feeling, what we're thinking, because you'd be surprised at who would help you with what you're going through. Absolutely. And that's such a real thing. Um, I know for me, I've committed to living a life of transparency, and it's to the point where sometimes people get offended by the truth, and I'm like, this is the truth. What do you want from me? <laughs> but we've lived, we've become a culture that is used to the fluff, the the good answers, but really and truly, I have, when I decided to start Nicole's Network, I said, you know what, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to put it all out there. And I'm going to be willing to talk about even the very things people don't want to talk about. Like, I'll bring up my miscarriages in regular conversation and think nothing of it. People get like, oh, my God, why are we talking about this? And I'm like, it happened. It's my story. It is what it is. My twins are still a part of my life, whether they're here in person or not. I'm willing to talk about anything, literally. But it makes people uncomfortable. People go around saying, oh, I'm an honest person. I want the truth. Do you really? <laughs> Do you really? When you you're can't friend, handle the truth. Exactly. Like when your best friend is telling you, listen, you done messed up. You slacking. You ain't doing what you're supposed to do. People want the truth when it's beneficial to them. Mm. They don't want the truth when it hurts. If you want the truth, 
you got to be willing to accept the good, the bad, the ugly, the you slacking. I need you to pick it up. And the you're being too hard on yourself. You're better than this. You need to be willing to accept all of the truth. The whole mm -hmm. truth, nothing but the truth. So help me God. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about Nicole's network. What is it? What do you do? Why did you start it? Absolutely. Um, I Nicole's network is really a company that's devoted to inspiring people to be the best version of themselves, to constantly work towards self-development, and to motivate others to find the, the freedom in the most authentic version of you. And so through that, we have our, month, our Motivational Mondays, which is a weekly video blog. I have a written blog called Thoughtful Thursdays, in which I kind of, it's kind of a how-to guide as far as just how to get through the different challenges of life. Um, every day I post inspirational messages on my Twitter, my Instagram, and my Facebook page. And then also I have my book, which we talked a little bit about. Um, I do motivational speaking as well as I hold, I do development coaching. So if you need someone to help you get through, um, get from point A to point B and maybe even C, D, and E, um, I'm definitely able to hold you accountable. We can sit down and talk about your goals how you're going to get there and then weekly accountability calls to make sure you're making progress. Speaking of accountability and forgive me if this is a little bit off topic, but I'm just, when you said it just now, it brought me back to the conversation you had with your almost fiance. And I saw something, um, somebody posted and it's been shared 700,000 times since then about, you know, when you're almost clear, you're going to keep getting, something that's kind of close but not really sort of what you want um, keep moving because the more experiences you have and the clearer you get on exactly it is exactly what it is that you want the closer you'll be to getting it so i remember i'll say maybe five years ago somebody asked me um what kind of guys do i like and i said nice guys and i dated a nice guy but he wasn't the right guy for me and i thought about what about our relationship because I really don't have any complaints about him as a person. What I really wanted from a relationship that I didn't get in that relationship. And I said, okay, well, I want somebody who is actively pursuing their goals, doesn't just have them, you know, things, you know, it, it really made me get much clearer on that. So I want to ask you, what are some goals that you sat down and developed for yourself after that relationship dissolved? Yes. So after that, so around like when I was 23, so is that what you're asking? Yes. Okay. Um, one of the goals was I wanted to be financially stable. So being a mother and a wife, was it, the goal never went away. But what I committed to was I want to be prepared for that life. I don't want to stumble into a marriage, and I don't want to stumble into motherhood. Um, I want to be ready for those, those decisions. And so it was making sure I paid off, like got my credit together, making sure I learned how to manage money. As the daughter of, account, of an accountant, you would assume I know how to manage money. I had to learn it for myself. I couldn't take my mother's lessons. I had to figure it out. And now I'm a little bit better at it, um, a lot better at it to say the least. Um, but figuring out the finances, um, I wanted to get my real estate license. And I did. Um, I wanted to travel more, which I'm getting in the swing of things. Um, it's still a work in progress because when you have the time, you don't have the money. When you don't, when you have the money, you don't have the time. Oh my goodness! In 2018, I will be traveling. <laughs> Girl, <laughs> what? Um, traveling more. I wanted to re-engage with cheerleading. I cheered my whole life, um, and I wanted to give back as well as and be coaching, uh, which I'm now coaching, and I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. Um, being more involved and having more of an active relationship with God. I mm. had grown up in the church my whole life, um, but my relationship with God was dependent on my relationship with others. So what I mean by that was I went to church with my mother. I went to church with my ex. After he and I broke up and I was in a whole new area, I had to figure out my relationship for myself. I had to figure out what does my relationship with God look like for me? Um, I was concerned with my weight at the time and not necessarily that I was overweight. I just knew I wasn't doing the best that I could. 
Um, so I focus on my physical health, my financial health, my spiritual health, my emotional health. I was consistent with my therapy as well and unpacking some of that baggage. Um, I wanted to get better at dating. Um, I wanted to just a whole transformational process in every area. And I wanted to, more importantly, heal from those daddy issues that I knew were there. And I knew they were there, but at that time, I thought, as long as he's not creating more damage, then I'm okay. So, so let's talk about that because, yeah. and, and I'll let you continue your, your thought there if you would like to, but when I started this blog, the direction I was going in then is very different than the direction I'm taking it in now. And my initial intention before it became where daddy issues draw discussion, I really wanted people to see that daddy issues manifest themselves differently in everyone. For me, I was about the same age as you, 23, 24. Um, I had a, a bachelor's degree in business management. I had just finished a master's degree program, but was unable to graduate due to some foolishness. So I'm like, here it is. I got three degrees by 23. And now I really can't access my two masters. I, I'm not doing what I thought I wanted to be doing anymore. And as far as my relationships were concerned, I knew that I was not treating the people that I was in relationship with as best as they deserve to be treated. So I just kind of like stopped dating and all that stuff. But I had never thought or acknowledged that I had daddy issues up until that point. So my first few blogs talk about, you know, I had trust issues. I was very clear about that. And it wasn't until I was, you know, 23 and a half, 24 years old with no job and nothing but time to really sit and reflect on myself that I realized like, oh, this is the reason you have trust issues. So, you know, or this is the reason you have abandonment issues. This is the reason you don't like that rejection feeling when you want to invite your friends to do something, but they made plans with other mutual friends that you weren't invited to participate on. So tell me some of the daddy issues that you knew were there that you just weren't ready to address at that time. So I like, like to know to you, I knew I had the symptoms of daddy issues, didn't realize my father had as much impact in my life as he did. So I knew I had abandonment issues. I knew I had um, not commitment issues in a traditional sense, but all I wanted was commitment. Like if we were dating, I'm already thinking about the wedding, the marriage, the kids, this and a third, because to me, for well, and this still holds true. I personally, for myself, plan on getting married one time. And Amen. so if I got married, I had somebody who would be there for forever. I wanted kids so badly because that's unconditional love. That love is never going to go anywhere. And so while I had all these symptoms floating around, I never really realized he was the reason. Mm. I'm like, well, damn, you done set me up. <laughs> um, but I'm a, I'm a very uh, driven kind of person. So once I realize something's an issue, I'm like, all right, cool. How are we going to work this out? How are we going to figure this issue out? Because I got things to do. <laughs> I hear that. So, you know what's funny, though? Go ahead. Finish your thought. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, um, so for me, it was really um, tackling my therapy sessions and mm -hmm. saying, this is my issue. Let's focus on this. Let's make this happen, Captain. <laughs> Listen, you know what? It sounds like you really got the best of your therapy because I know a lot of people who go and who who don't want to be there or who aren't ready to be there or who don't have therapists they feel connected with to make those types of demands like hey I'm here to tackle this and I need you to help me tackle this but what I was laughing at was you said you wanted to have children because that's unconditional love and I wonder if that's if, if you feel that way about children giving you un unconditional love because you feel prepared to give that to them <laughs> because to me it was like okay well you said this but earlier you felt like you know parents shouldn't feel entitled to that love so that that was just interesting to me yeah, so, yes, I definitely can see where the, you know, the confusion is on that part. Um, I think what was different for me was 
while my father was very inconsistent, my mother has never left my side. And because of her consistent loyalty, the love is absolutely unconditional. And I knew that if I did have kids, I would never be able to go weeks and months and years without speaking to my child. That my child could look me in the face and say, I hate you. And I will still, you know, tuck them in at night, you know? So, yes. So what I'm, <clears throat> what I'm saying by that is that unconditional love breeds unconditional love. Inconsistent love breeds inconsistent love. So I, I, I got what you meant. Yeah, I, because, I, I would be giving unconditional love. Yes. And even in those moments where it didn't look like that was going to be received, mm -hmm. it would still be there. No, I got what you meant. I just wanted to make sure that I pointed that out so you have the opportunity to clarify for yourself because we we have parallel stories so i definitely i knew where you were coming from but it just kind of made me chuckle like we just had this conversation yeah. <laughs> um but along those lines about the parallels when you and i met you shared with me that you have a younger sister and so do i and can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with your younger sister i know um other guests have shared that their relationship with their dad has caused them to not feel connected with their siblings, and I, I've shared some of the ways I feel about my siblings from time to time, but can you tell us a little bit about your sister? Absolutely. So my sister and I have different fathers. Um, from her father, she has two older sisters who are both younger than me. So we kind of consider us all just sisters at this point, despite the fact that we have three different mothers in play and two different fathers at play. Um, we actually just sat down on Christmas. The four of us um, and my mother were discussing daddy issues, honestly. Um, and I was relatively quiet in the conversation. So even though I'm the oldest sister, I was quiet because I, I sensed that they needed to vent and they needed to get it off their chest. So I was like, you know what? I done vented. That, that's what I told my mother. I was like, I got it off my chest. It's all in my book. He's read the book. He knows where exactly where I stand, where I stood, and where I, you know, where I'm aiming to stand. Um, but me and my younger sister, uh, we're ten years apart. Um, I I love her with all of my heart. Sometimes I end up being a second mother to her which I swear is not on purpose. Where You know, I wish my sister was in the room right now because she said, she's been saying that this whole weekend. Like, could you stop being my other mom? Right. And, and it absolutely. I mean, at this point, it is what it is. I love you anyway. <laughs> um, and I won't, you know, share her story too much, but because um, I feel like everyone should have a right to tell their own story. Absolutely. Um, but what I will say is, it has been difficult for me as the oldest because I feel like she's looking to me to see how do you maneuver daddy issues. And she's looking to me to see how do you maneuver life? Mm. And so it has definitely always been that pressure that on my shoulders that I know she's always watching. And every single thing I've ever done in my life, she's watching. Um, and likely aspiring to live in a similar manner so it is my job as her big sister to be the best example of black girl magic i can possibly be to show her what black girl magic looks like um so that's one of the challenges that i have for myself is to say you know i want to be the best big sister possible even if that looks like being her second mom sometimes um, but definitely it's been a challenge because sometimes I don't feel comfortable talking about my daddy issues because ours are kind of, it's similar, but it's different. Mm -hmm. So with my father, he's always wanted a relationship with me. It's been me who's decided to say, no, I'm good. Whereas with her father, she's always wanted the relationship and he's, you know, not answered phone calls or walked away or you know, left her hanging on certain special days and things like that. Whereas with my father, if I told him, I need you here Tuesday at three o'clock in the afternoon, he'll probably be there. You know, so a lot of times when I'm expressing how I feel about my daddy issues, it hurts her because her daddy isn't trying and her daddy isn't making those types of efforts. And it almost seems like 
I'm ungrateful. And, um, and that's not that she said that, but that's how it comes across sometimes. Like you, your dad wants to be a part of your life and you're pushing him away when you have some people who either their father has passed or their father can't be a part of their life or won't be a part of their life. And yet you're pushing away yours, um, for whatever reason. But at the end of the day, how I feel is how I feel. And I and nobody allow. should tell you how to feel Absolutely. because they, they don't live your experiences. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what I had to realize. So there are a lot of times we don't talk about daddy issues probably as much as we should, but I think it's because from my perspective, we come from polar opposites as far as the experiences and how we feel about our fathers. And then from her perspective, um, a, she's a teenager, and then B, um, a lot of times she just doesn't want to, who likes to feel vulnerable, you know? Mm. Um, and so that talking about daddy issues often puts her in a very, very vulnerable place. And one thing I do not play about, and you can ask anyone that knows me, I don't play about my sister. I will kill for that girl. And so when I see tears on her face because of the person who procreated her, it pisses me off. Like, I'm ready to go call him, like, sir. Pull up. <laughs> you hear me? He's like, no problem. And he's had the same number her whole life. Try me. Oh, no. Cash me outside. You Cash know. me outside. Like, Come on, I'm, sir. Because that's my baby sister. Like, and I really, I, what, I, what I know for sure is she has a heart of gold, and her heart does not deserve to be broken by anybody, especially her father. Mm, that's deep um in my work that i was doing earlier I, it's not my first time seeing this quote but it said you know my dad broke my heart before before any boy had a chance to and that's what that's what that you know made me think of i, I really hope if nothing else that of all of the discussion room conversations that i have held and will hold coming forward that it, it starts to make men look at the impact because i think sometimes I'll, I'll tell you what i know for a fact my biological father wrote to me in a letter and he said i will not say that i would change things if i could because who's to say that part of my absence hasn't been part of your success and what made you who you are and i was much younger i, I don't even know if i was in college or out of college yet i think i might have been late high school and freshman year of college or something like that but because i had stopped talking to him when i was 17 i was like all right i don't have the time for these games anymore i'm over it you know I'm grown but up. right and you know what i had a decent relationship with his family so i knew who i came from i knew who i belonged to what whatever feelings or thoughts i had about them was completely different but i had family i think there's so many people out here who don't know their biological father who know him, whose family denies them. And I think that's what hurts a lot of people more than anything is that you're not just rejected by that man, you're rejected by that family. And, and there's another quote I read a few months ago behind every deadbeat dad is a deadbeat grandmother. And we can go there, but we won't. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, so I, I, I think that, that 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 plays a role there. So I just like what I was getting at is that I, I, I truly genuinely hope that men realize that it's bigger than your relationship with that child. My father may have been absolutely right that if anything changed and if he was more present, he may have had a negative influence over me or whatever the case may be. And I think that having that letter because I, I found it um, and moving about a year ago, that kind of helped me be prepared to reconnect. But I think it's bigger than that, because even though those words might be true, I missed out on a relationship with my brother. I missed out on a relationship with my other sister. We are in communication with each other now, but we could have had a better relationship. I look at my stepsisters and how close they are to one another. And sometimes I feel like the outsider. And they ask me, like, we don't leave you out. And I'm like, you're right. You don't. But it's not the same. It's not the same, and I and I just feel jealous because even though they include me, I don't have that aside from them, with my other siblings. So I I really just hope that that fathers in general take a a 
take responsibility and accountability for the role they play. I think we've had so much single mother empowerment and upliftment, and there's nothing wrong with that, that it may have led men to believe that their role is not valuable and it's not necessary. And that's, that's just fundamentally false. Yeah. And I want to something. So the first part where you said how missing out on relationship with your father meant missing out on family as well. Um, my little sister, and like I told you, she has two other sisters. Um, she only gets to see them Christmas. And the only reason she does see them, the oldest of them three lives in Minnesota, for starters. The middle lives in D.C., literally around the corner. But the only reason she gets to see them for Christmas is because the oldest comes down to this area and will pick them up. The father, who also lives in this area, could see two of the three very regularly if he chose to. But because he doesn't choose to, their only valuable time together is when the oldest comes down and makes it happen. So imagine how that was before she was old enough to drive and et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, The other piece I want to address is it's so critical, the father's role, because your sons are going to grow up to do what you do. And your daughters are going to grow up to marry someone just like you. They're not going to listen to your words. They're going to listen to your actions. That's why things like domestic abuse is such a generational thing. If I grow up watching my mother get beat, the boys are going to think this is okay. And the women are going to think it's tolerable because this is what I grew up watching. At least he was in the house, right? You know, and those are the type of things that are going to come up. But so many times we don't realize that my romantic decisions impact my child's romantic decisions as well. And I love Love the way you phrase that. Keep going. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I just really hope we as a millennial generation get it together. Like, you don't have to be with your, you know, um, child's parent, child's other parent or whatever. You know, things happen. I get that. But, like, I actually, the last guy I was dating, I had to tell him, I'm like, he has a son, but he wants a daughter. And I'm like, how would you feel if your daughter called you and crying her heart out because of the very thing you just did. Like, how would that make you feel? You'd be ready to kill somebody because they treated your daughter like crap when really and truly, you do the same thing. Like, I remember when, um, I call him my ex-baby daddy because the babies ain't here no more. (laughs) So when me and my ex-baby daddy, we fought a lot. And I remember my father wanting to literally go beat him up. And I'm like, bruh, he ain't doing nothing that you didn't do. The back and forth, the emotional abuse, the manipulation. Like, it's literally the same things you did. What are you surprised about? Literally. Mm-hmm. Like, what What are you going to say? I can do it, but you can't? I think they think that way. I, I really do think that it's like that. Um, from what you said just now. Let let me let me make sure I'm getting <laughs> the right point. Because what I'm thinking about um from what you said as far as one, I love the way you phrase it, your romantic decisions influence your child's romantic decisions because um you mentioned this earlier and I'm like, dang, she couldn't have ordered that any more perfectly. But you you were talking about the advice you gave to the woman at your church and you were saying this is what I wish my mother knew I'm actually launching a campaign next month to collect stories um and the title is what I wish my mother knew so when I was sharing that with my mom she was like why do you want to do that you don't even have any kids because in reality for me talking to you talking to so many other women thus far and even the men who I have scheduled for um the beginning of 2018 A lot of them wish their mom had done things differently, whether it's leave a relationship sooner, whether it was to stand up for themselves, even if they didn't want their mom to leave the relationship, they wanted their mom to to move different. You know, like, hey, you know, you shouldn't let that person talk to you like that. I think a lot of times kids know, kids know better. Kids know mommy should not be talking to daddy like that. Daddy should not be talking to mommy like that. Chairs shouldn't be flying across the room. There should not be holes punched in the wall. All these things, kids know better. 
And and even if it's not anything as dramatic as that, I know I had a woman on a few weeks ago talking about perfect daddy syndrome. And for her, her dad was her primary guardian. He he was the parent in the household with her while her mom went to seminary school. And there were things about being a woman and being in relationship that she wished her mom had shared with her sooner. So I definitely think that it's an important conversation to have with mothers and with women in general about what we wish our mothers knew um, and from men's perspective as well. But just to share with the new generation of moms so that they can move different because we take for granted sometimes that they're watching. Your children are watching. And if they're not moving like you move, they're treating you the way the other parent is treating you. And either way, you're losing. Either way, you're losing. Yeah, it's such a tricky balance because I feel like I feel like mothers do the best that they can at the time that they that they have that opportunity. And that's what my mom said. Yeah, I mean, like when I think about my mother, like yes, there are things I wish she would have done differently, but I do recognize she did the best with what she had at that point. Um, and one thing that she has stated that I, I hope other mothers get. Um, is that you can't make up for the father. Mm-hmm. And I remember her telling me, she was like, I can't be your father. All I can be is the best mother I can be. And that has to be enough. Because no woman can teach a man, like you can't teach a man how to be a man. And you can't teach a woman what a man is supposed to teach her. That's the father's job. And really and truly, I think the piece that we're missing out on is when you take away the father from the household you end up with mama's boys right and then you end up with girls who don't need a man tell me when i told a lie okay (laughs) (laughs) and the reason being is because you're missing that balance so the mother is really really you know has that nurturing relationship with their sons and love them to death and things like that but the father's supposed to come in and give that that tough love, that, you know, that stability and train them how to be a man. Whereas the father is supposed to love and nurture and school the daughter and the mother's supposed to step in and say, no, no, you need to clean your room first. No, no, you know, to kind of create that balance. That balance. Exactly. When you take that man out the equation, you get soft men and hard women. Now, you know what? Two things I want to say. The point I wanted to make before when I had to gather my thoughts was that, in my opinion, it's not always about having a two-parent household. It's just about having two parents who love themselves and who are able to love you. Because I think that sometimes, um, like you said before, he was in the house, though. The, then it was on Sister Circle last week, and I shared the clip on my, my Facebook page for Damn Daddy. They were talking about fathers who are in the home but don't participate in parenting. They just there. The mom do everything, and they just there. And I, I think that that's how you end up with mama's boys, like you said, but also just men who don't know how to be providers. And then you wonder why women are getting called gold diggers. It's not because they don't want to deal with men in regular jobs. Not everybody's out here looking for a baller. It's that they're tired of dealing with men who don't know how to provide for themselves. And, you know, when you have some per- a person who, who is overly attached to their mom, sometimes it's not a bad thing. Sometimes they really genuinely had a great caring relationship with their mom and they want to look out for mom, but they are capable of being independent and having a lot for themselves. And then you have young men who don't know how to come up off the mom's, you know, she's still suckling. She's still suckling. You know, he didn't, he ain't never lived nowhere but with her. She's still paying the phone bills and all the other bills. And he 37 years old. Like that to me is, is when things have gone too far, especially if this person is physically and mentally capable of going out there and get it on their own. Why are you doing all that mom? Because at that point, you're not being both mom and dad. At that point, you you being a sucker. Yeah. And I would question, because I do know quite a few people in those scenarios, but I would question how involved is the father figure? Because I don't know a man who will let their grown son leech off of them. 
I'm not saying it ain't possible, but if there's a father figure in the scenario, is he actively involved too? Because yeah, I don't, I don't know about that. You said I'm and the person I'm thinking of, they do have a dad who lives in the home. You know, I wasn't thinking of that person initially when I made this statement, but I, I, I have an example of someone who has married parents who've been together his whole life, and 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 living at home meaning I go to work, I come home, sit in front of the TV. Go to work, come home, sit in front of the TV. Um, don't talk to me. My show's going. I'm watching the game. And therefore, the particular person that I have in mind now has children of their own and is technically old enough to be a grandfather. And not only do they still live with their parents, but they they have a pattern of mistreating women in their parents' home and in their parents' presence. So to me, you can have two parents and they, they just collectively as a unit not doing a good job. Um, so that... I don't, I ain't even think about that. That person wasn't even on my radar until you said that statement. I thought him up real quick. That's crazy. But um, that's crazy that I actually know someone who's living that life. And I threw out the number 37 to be funny. But, like, no, he, he's a very grown man. Yeah. He's a very grown man capable of doing for himself and, and just don't. Uh, wow. I'm going to have to look more into that particular situation. But. I want to get back to new beginnings. We are here on December 28th. 28 is my favorite number. So I was so glad you wanted to move the conversation to today. And I meant I got to rest last week. But it's the end of 2017. And for me, if I could summarize 2017, I would say it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Okay. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to new beginnings. What are some new beginnings you're looking forward to? And you, you shared a little bit about why it matters to you to rebuild your relationship with your dad for your sister's sake, but what do you want to get out of it? You said he knows where you stand, where you stood, and where you plan to stand. So where do you plan to stand? What does your new beginning look like? For me, it's a stress-free life. Honestly, really and truly, because I realized I have, I have been holding on to a grudge for 26 years. Homeboy been out here living his best life. Okay, but I'm sitting here hurting. I'm upset. I'm pissed off and angry. And this, that, third. I don't have the energy for it. I really don't. And I think once I came to that realization, like this is taking up more energy than I'm willing to give. That was the moment where I was like, you know what? It is what it is. And I think when I realized how much impact my daddy issues had had in every other relationship in my life. Um, that's when I began to make it a focus. And I even remember telling my therapist, I was like, listen, I want to heal from the issues, but I don't want a relationship with them. Which, of course, she then threw in my face like, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know, and one thing that bothers me the most, more than anything you can possibly fathom, is when people tell you, well, if you don't want to talk to him, then you clearly still got an issue. You still upset. Girl, I hated that. I really and truly hated for people to tell me that. I don't. I just don't have a desire to have a relationship with somebody who's abusive. If I was dating somebody who's beat me upside the head, you wouldn't say, oh, well, you ain't over it because you're not sleeping with him again. Huh? It don't make no sense. It really doesn't. So as I think about new beginnings, um, for me, it really is just inner peace. It mm. really is. And realizing this is who he is. This is what he did. At this point, I can't change who my father is. I can't change what he's done. And I can't change his characteristics. And it's also about lowering those expectations. So for me, it was like, okay, I had you, on a, I had you here. My mother's here. The least you could do is be here. But really, you like here. So now I'm like, you know what? This is the expectation. He's going to be back and forth. He doesn't know how to love properly because of his issues um, with his dad and his mom, honestly. And at this point, it is what it is. The show goes on. I, I just don't have the energy to keep holding on to the grudge. I really don't. And one of the things that kind of started the process was when I was pregnant. And it really challenged me to think because those were his grandchildren. And so I had to think, so A, do 
I allow them to have a, a grandfather in the picture, um, which would have been their only grandfather, given you know the, their father scenario. So do I allow him to be in the picture as their grandfather? What does my relationship look like with him because of his grandchildren? And on top of that, the other part of that coin was, do I, because as a mother, you want nothing more than to protect your children. So if I know this is a dangerous space, should I allow him to be in his children's life? Because it was hurtful to me. I haven't seen him figure it out yet. Is it going to be hurtful for him too? Um, so that was definitely kind of where the conversation started. Um, and then since it got a little awkward when I miscarried them, because it was like, I was only talking to you for them. <laughs> Awkward a little bit, um, but eventually, you know, it got to the point where, you know, I was like, "Listen, this is what it is." And I think a huge turning point um, really was me putting the truth out there. Well, putting my truth in the book because, for one, it felt like the very first time he heard me. Mm. I had told him how I felt before, but then it would get cut off, and he would try to explain it away. He would give all these different excuses and things like that. So this was the first time uninterrupted. You got to hear my point of view. That's it. That's all. Um, and even before the book, uh, before the book new party, he asked to read it in advance. And I was like, because I, I reached out to him. I said, listen, there's going to be some things in this book that may be hurtful, but it's my truth. And um, I told him, I said, I hope you can accept it for it being my truth. And maybe one day we can move forward from here. Um, he actually replied back and he was like, listen, I'm proud of you for owning your truth. And this was your story. And you have the right to tell it however you, however you experienced it. Um, and just to hear, like, I'm proud of you when I, some of the things in this book, like, it ain't so nice. <laughs> it ain't so nice. Um, but that w I think that was a huge turning point for us. And he was there at the book release party as well. Um, and he spoke, you know, a, a, a lot of my friends and family got up and spoke as well. But he was one of the people to speak. And I think it really was just owning my truth and not being afraid of what the truth would do. Um, mm. Because I had held on to the 100% the tr the whole truth. I'd held on to it for so long because A, I didn't think he would listen and B, I didn't think he would be receptive. And so now that that's out of the way and now that you know exactly how I feel, now we can actually figure out what this looks like. And I honestly don't know what I hope to get out of the relationship um, other than free food. To be honest, <laughs> I love free food. <laughs> so he's like, you want to go to dinner? I'm so freaking lonely. <laughs> That's so messed up, but it's my truth, okay? It's my truth. If you want to feed me, I am down, okay? <laughs> um, wow. One thing I do hope is that he and I can figure it out before I do have, um, you know, give birth to children. Um, because I think I'm seeing now the importance of having that father figure in, in your life, and even if that's a grandfather as well. And that's a great point, because... Um, I'm here. We came down. My grandparents don't celebrate Christmas, but we didn't get to spend Thanksgiving with them this year, so we came and surprised them. And I was sharing with um, my sister, you know, just how my grandfather has been very honest with me that who he is today is not who he was as a parent. He's a very different person as a grandfather than he was as a parent, so that I understand that his children aren't deceiving me when they share their truth. And my grandfather is a great person. Like most people have nothing but great things to say about him. But sometimes he'll tell me things about before he was a father and being a jealous individual because my grandmother is beautiful. But you know, just, it is important sometimes, even if the biological father can't be present, that if the grandfather is available, um, you know, to be open to that. I do respect the fact that you considered if this person caused me so much hurt and pain, would it be a good idea to expose my children to that type of uh, emotional instability? And, you know, because that's, that's what it is, but 
when you said earlier that it's generational, it made me think about a conversation I had with a friend of mine. She's been with me from the time that I decided to start this blog. And I go visit her and I bring my little notebook and I'm like, all right, I got to write it about these three things before the ideas are gone. And we had a conversation one time about how, as far as my father's family is concerned, I never felt distant from them. We grew up in the same city. Whenever um, his sister was in town, I was there, but it wasn't until being an adult that I realized how much I wasn't around, how much that they had gone through in, in his mother's home, because my father's mother lived a few blocks away from me growing up. Um, you know, and my, uh, several of my cousins lived with her. And realizing as an adult that even though my father was incarcerated majority of my childhood, I pretty much had the better scenario. When we, we sit down and we talk about, you know, what they experienced, what they had gone through, how they feel now about my uncles, and just even how a lot of times they felt like I was being too harsh. Oh, why are you treat my uncle like that? And, you know, one of my uncles who absolutely I love finding out from his son that we 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 had the same situation going on where he felt great about my father and I felt great about his father, but we both felt like they don't you know they not doing nothing as a father. Great uncles, but not great fathers. And we talked about how that's generational, um, because to my understanding, because even though I've met their father on several occasions, I don't, I genu generally don't interact with him. He's always mistaken me for my other cousin. We're only four months apart, but we're two very different people. So I, I probably was like six when I decided I was just over him. Like, you gonna stop calling me her name. She right there, you know. Um, and I don't, I don't have the full T on that, but to my understanding, um, their parents divorced because he was abusive. And although none of my uncles or my aunt really seemed to, to want to confirm that being the case, um, it just made me think about all the things that I've heard because I never really see them act out. But the things that I've heard about my uncles and, and the women they date, and if those things are true, what I've heard about their father and their relationship, his relationship with their mom, if those things are true, it's generational. And then I see those things manifesting in my cousins. And I have to say to my cousins, I, I literally had to say this to one of my male cousins. He and I are two years apart. When we were teenagers, he came and stayed for about a year, maybe less than a year with my mom. Um, and I hadn't seen him in maybe about eight years when I went to visit him. And I didn't like the way he was treating the mother of his child. And they had three children together at this point. But I was like, why are you doing that? You know, because you, you would have lost your mind if somebody did any of that to me. I know you would. I know you would be in somebody's silver bracelets if somebody did that to me. She should have had a cousin in or she, should, she needs some brothers. And I'm like, that should not be the mentality. If you don't want anybody doing that to me, you don't want anything to do that, anybody doing that to your sister to your niece, to the daughter that you now have, why are you doing that to her? And I really wanted to ask her, why are you staying? But because of my relationship with him, I felt like I would be doing his children, that young woman, and myself a disservice not to say something. You know that's not okay. You know for a fact that you will lose your mind if somebody even said half of what you just said to her to me. I don't like it. You don't get to treat her like that. If I find out you're still treating her like that, I'll come back up here and me and you gonna have a problem. And he's he's like six and a half feet tall and I'm barely five feet. But I just felt like that was my job as his cousin, as someone he loves and trusts to say that. Because I, I really think that they feel like it's okay to mistreat other people and want to hurt somebody for mistreating the people they love. I'm like, just because she don't have no brothers don't mean it's okay. You better be happy she don't have no brothers to come kick your behind the way you would kick somebody else's. That right there, just the thought of you wanting to hurt somebody else should be enough for you not to do that to her. Absolutely. And one thing I do want to address from what you said, um, I think the reason why, like you said, how your uncle, you had a great uncle and then his son had a great uncle, but then the, you both struggle with your father. 
Um, I've seen that in my maternal side of the family and um, as far as my paternal side of my family. Like one of the issues my father used to always say was, well, your cousin runs up to me with open arms. He can't, she can't wait to jump inside my arms to see me, but then my daughter's giving me the cold shoulder. And I think really the truth is the expectation is a little bit different for uncles. Really and truly. Like I had a great uncle. Anytime I needed him, he was there. Do I talk to him all the time? No. Do I expect to? No. But anytime I've ever needed him, if I picked up the phone, he delivered. Whereas with my father, I expected you to be there all the time. Maybe not in the same household because my mother and my father are together. No, I'm, I'm good on that. I am good on that. Girl, me but too. I expected you to play an active role in my life. And so you coming in and out and just being there, you know, he treated fatherhood like unclehood. And that was where the problem, that's where the fight got started, honestly, because you can't just be there for holidays and be there for when I happen to call or if I happen to need something. That's not how fatherhood works. Fatherhood is 24 seven whether I live with you or not. And so those, and I think the difference too is like when I was considering him from the, for the grandfather position, the expectation is different. We don't see our grandparents all the time and we're okay with that. But the moment we don't see our father on a consistent basis, now it's an issue because the expectation is different. But the job requirements the job change. Requirements different. The I job requirements change. Absolutely. I think that's where I am now and why I'm able to get to new beginnings because one, I don't have any expectations. I see him when I see him. He shows up to what he shows up to. And it no longer hurts because I literally have cleaned the expectations. I know who you are. I know you're inconsistent. And at this point, like I said, I see you when I see you. If you call, I'll answer. If you ask me to go to dinner, okay. You know, but I'm not hurt because you didn't show up to this or hurt because you didn't call for this or hurt because you stopped calling. I remember there was a point where when I was in high school, my father would call me every night at nine o'clock on the dot. And for me, I've always been, I've always cherished transparency. So even in high school, I'm like, this isn't genuine. You faking the funk. If you have to set an alarm clock to call your daughter, you are faking the funk. You and know, I'm that's like, exactly what I was thinking. Like, oh, he probably has a reminder set. Right. Like, I, and, and honestly, I didn't want to talk to him. I'm like, what's the point? Just so you can say you called your daughter every night at 9 o'clock on the dot? Sir. It's not productive. So, But I would have rather a phone call every week and a half. Hey, just letting you know I'm thinking about you. But as opposed to a forced interaction, simply mm -hmm. because you think that's what you're obligated to do. Be genuine. Please be genuine. Like that, that's always been my thing with anybody in my life. Like, just be real. And if you don't genuinely have a need to call me, don't call me. That's okay. <laughs> that's so real. I think with our generation, we, we know more. And I say that because when I think about the, I, I'm fortunate enough that my grandparents still have aunts and uncles alive. So, I think I have a very youthful family because we haven't been forced to grow up due to loss. You know, since, you know, you lose a parent and you have to be that parent. We joke around and say you might be the second mom, but you know, you don't have that full responsibility for your sister. So I, I think about those things and how times have changed. In my grandparents' generation, it was normal for a woman to have a child and if things don't work out with that father the new husband take on that child and don't nobody talk about it i know at least three men grown men in my life who've gone through that and it's very strange for them to not know that until adulthood whereas for me i knew i knew who my father was i knew he wasn't around i knew why he wasn't around when i had a present stepfather that's who, who was in my household with me you know, I was happy. When that relationship ended, I was like, hold up. But, you know, my mom met my sister's dad and 
that was a little bit more challenging to adjust to just simply because I was used to something else. But, you know, again, there was a rebuilding there, but there was never any uh, dishonesty. So I think with our generation, our normal looks a lot different. Then we don't have the expectation of one family under a guise of unity if that's not the case. There might be a woman with children by several different men or a man with children by several different women, but they are working together to raise those children together and they don't sugarcoat things. You know, this kid may go be with their biological mother every other weekend, but they don't sugarcoat things. And I'm, I'm hoping that we get to a point where I don't know what's better. I'm, I'm not even going to lie. I, I, the elders in my families have shared to me why things were done the way they were done back then, where we feel like that's deception and that's dishonesty and why y'all do that. They've shared to me, you know, it was for easier household. You know what? I'll be the first to tell you when I was 14, me and my sister's father, we went at it. And one of the things that I said to him was, you're not my father. And my grandfather called me and was like, you thought that was okay to say to somebody? Because where is your real father at? And I was like, but he not though, you know? So for them, they, they were under that mentality that it's easier to, to do things this way because they don't have to have those types of arguments. So um, I just, I just don't, I still don't, I'm not going to judge which way of life is better, but I think that our generation is much more transparent because we've seen what it's done to the generation above us. And like you said, um, that they come from a generation where you just don't talk about certain things, really and truly. And like the argument that you had with your stepdad, if you ain't know, what would you have said? You know what I mean? Like you wouldn't have known. That I wouldn't have had the language to tell him that what he was doing was not okay to me. Right, right. But um, and, and it's just it's if you know better, you do better. Um, really and truly. And I think we're in a generation now where. We almost know too much. <laughs> like, it's information everywhere. But even truly, like, even things like what we're doing now, this isn't something that could have been done, you know, back in the day. Granted, the conversation could have happened, but as frequently, as diverse as the conversations, you know, it just wouldn't have been a thing. And being able to share it with so many other people, it our whole culture has become... Um, very informational to the point where we might be crippling ourselves. Um, but sometimes the information is necessary, but sometimes we take a little too far. <laughs> I can agree with that. I, I do think we have the tendency. Informational overload is real. I'll just, I'll leave it there for the sake of time. Um, are there any last Nicole's nuggets or gems you want to drop this evening? Um, any thoughtful ways to start new beginnings to, to go into 2018 feeling fresh and renewed and not holding on to 26 year long grudges because I know I shared with you a few weeks ago that I I too have reconnected with my father um and we went to, we went out to eat and I felt bad because I was in a rush I, I had to do one of these calls and it was like, you know, he seemed so excited and he was nice and he opened doors for me. And I was like, who is this person? And it made me wonder because he, he wasn't there. I won't say that he was a bad father. He wasn't there. He was constantly incarcerated. And when he wasn't incarcerated, he was using the time he was supposed to spend with me doing something else to get back incarcerated. So he never really had the opportunity to be present for me to really know him or to know how he would have treated me. But um, I I do I will say that I, I like the place we went to eat before he took me there. Like I was like, how did he know I like this place? Um anyway, all of that to say, it it was a it was a good experience. And I wish I was not in a rush to do something else. Like if I didn't have something to do that day, I would have stayed longer because we were at my uncle's house and I love my uncles. But I just I just wanna find out, you know, from your perspective because People are probably tired of hearing me talk all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a talker. It's what I do. Yeah, what yeah. What are What are your gems, your nuggets, things you would suggest people do 
I wanted to talk a little bit about therapy, but I just, I don't, I want to be respectful of people's time here. Um, I have not gone to therapy myself. I did used to work at a therapy office. So I, I would kind of like go vent to my supervisors every now and then if things got too heavy for me to, to do my job effectively. And if I just needed a moment, but it's something that's been suggested to me. It's something that my friends have done and are sharing the benefits and a few few people that I've talked to, yourself included now, have shared how therapy has been helpful to them. So let's talk about therapy, your nuggets and gems going into the new year and any thoughtful ways to have new beginnings and not hold on to grudges. Um, so absolutely, therapy is an amazing thing. Um, I swear by it. And it's uh, unfortunately, within the African American community, there's such a stigma attached to it. Um, but it's so helpful. You don't have to have um, a disorder in order to go see therapy. Honestly, it's a safe place to be vulnerable and it's a safe place to vent, um, really and truly. And I think we all deserve that. Um, but, girl, we can talk about that for Alpha. Um, <laughs> One thing I will say, and I'm, I'm like thinking about my, like what nugget can I come up with about this topic? But, but I think I'll say, love yourself wholly and own your truth. And I think if you're able to accomplish those, you won't be afraid to speak your truth. And I think if you love yourself, you give people less power to hurt you. Mm. Um, and you begin to create boundaries so that you can be in my life, but what you can't do is this. You can be in my life, but I won't allow this to happen. And I think those boundaries start to come once you learn to love yourself wholly. Um, and once you own your truth, you can't help but speak it uh, really and truly. So I think between the two of those, um, it's definitely helpful towards new beginnings, um, particularly with issues of, around father figures. Um, and as far as letting go of the grudge, let it go. It's only hurting you. Um, and I wish I knew that, or I wish I believed that. Um, but, and I'm not going to sit here and say that you're still holding on to the anger, but the energy it takes to hold the grudge is too much energy that energy could be used in a more productive manner and it could be used towards your goals and your aspirations and things like that. Um, and the last thing that I will say is to the women, um, please make sure as you're choosing parents for your, for your children, which yes, it is a choice who you choose to have children with, as you're choosing a father for your child, please keep their future in mind, not just the but is he going to be a great father? And men, as you are choosing to have children with women, step up and, and accept the responsibility that you help create. Um, you want to make sure that that's a two-way street, um, really and truly. And I think so many times we minimize the choice we have in choosing um, our baby daddy. Um, and, and I can be honest and say the. The father of my, my twins was not the best father that I would have chosen, but I was in love and it happened. But now I realize you got to be careful who you let be a baby daddy. You got to be careful. And there are ways to, to prevent such. So um, making sure that parenthood is more of an active choice than a reaction. You don't spark the whole nother set of questions over here. Um, I'll, the next one, it's okay. We can talk about it. <laughs> well, I, I won't keep you long, but it just it made me think about the choice to have children, and you said you were in love. So two things came to mind. My mom, the first one, my mom always told me, you know, don't lay down with somebody you couldn't see yourself raising kids with. So I took that very seriously, and you know probably too seriously at times but I really do I'm I'm very selective about the people I share my time with in general because it's like you don't like you and you only like me for a b or c reason you know I don't see this going well you're fun 
but I don't see this being long term or, you know, just being careful of, of the people we lay down with because those things are permanent. And she also taught me um, to know that person's family, the importance of knowing that person's family and their upbringing before you choose to have a child with them. So that, that was one. But two, it made me listening to you say that you would have picked a better dad for your twins, but you loved him. Has your idea on love changed? since that time when you conceived and miscarried your twins and if so why girl oh my goodness um my miscarriages were a life-changing experience um it literally broke me down to absolutely nothing and i had to rebuild from there and so as you rebuild from there and i used to say this all the time but when you've had to fight for your joy and fight for peace, you're less likely to give it away to somebody who don't deserve it. Mm. I've had to learn and earn how to be happy after miscarrying my twins. I literally had to fight for my happiness. I'm not putting that in your hands if you can't handle it. Because really and truly, I work too hard to be happy. I work too hard to survive the grief of a miscarriage. I miscarried my twins. I found out one was dead on my birthday. And I found out the second one had suffered brain damage as a result of the first miscarriage and delivered both of my twins three weeks later. You don't recover from something like that and just give away your happiness willy-nilly. No, no, no. I work too hard for it. I literally worked entirely too hard for happiness to be just careless with it at this point. Um, So it has definitely taught me uh, what I am willing and what I'm not willing to tolerate. Um, Because really and truly, I think a large part of the miscarriage was stress. And all of my stressors at that point streamlined back to my baby daddy. So had I made a different choice, I don't know, everything happens for a reason, but a lot of the stress that I went through was unnecessary. And a lot of the stress I went through was because of who I was in relationship with. So because of that, it has absolutely changed how I look at dating relationships. And I still want to get married. You holding up progress. Like, I got things to do. <laughs> People to see in me in places to go. Okay. If you're not my husband, you got to go. And it's okay. It is okay. Really and truly, um, me, my best friend and I, we actually, so separately, we wrote down a list of qualifications. Like, if you don't measure up to my qualifications, toodles, you got to go. Because really and truly, my husband is waiting on me to be ready. And so, if you're not my husband, that means I still got more work to do, and I still got to get this focus. Like, I got things to do. So, yeah, um, it has absolutely changed, to say the least how I look at dating um and it wasn't until the person right after my ex-baby daddy who ended up being the same type of person I said wait a minute first of all we can't flag on the play flag on the play we will not do this again and the only reason I didn't end up pregnant because he was trying to get me pregnant but I was on birth control and I was like listen we're not doing this again um but really and truly I said um I had to have an honest conversation with myself. You are who you attract. So mm. if I keep attracting all these broken men, if I keep attracting men who ain't got it together, who are emotionally damaged, something's wrong with me. And I need to figure that out. And so I spent quite a good deal of time not involved with anyone emotionally, not involved with anyone physically, just alone with myself after that, that repeat relationship, basically. I said, listen, I need to figure out whatever it is that my issue is and I need to heal that part of me because the part there's a broken part of me that keeps attracting these broken men. And until I heal that, I won't have healthy relationships. Okay. <laughs> that makes complete sense. That makes complete sense. I thank you so much for your time this evening. It's been a joy to have this conversation. Thank you for coming to the discussion room. Thank you, thank you for having me. <laughs> uh, tell everybody where we can find you. 
Yes, Instagram and Twitter. My at my at handle is um, Tierra Nicole ten eleven. T i a r a n i c o l e. My name is spelled really regular. It's okay. No, no extra R's, no E's. So Tierra Nicole ten eleven on Instagram and Twitter. On Facebook and YouTube, it's Nicole's Network. It's an apostrophe S on there. Um, you can definitely reach out to me. I love to hear your thoughts. Um, so follow me, like, share, comment, post, all of the above. I'm a very engaged person on social media. So definitely reach out to me. And if it's your first time in a discussion room, again, my name is Miss Reed. I'm the founder of DamnDaddy.com, where daddy issues drive discussion. You can follow me at D triple A M N D A D D Y. That's D triple A M N Dam Daddy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. That's also the name of my website. And I thank you all for being here with me and Miss Tiara Riley this evening. If you are interested in going through some of the work that she's done, please pick up her book, 23 and Finally Loving Me. I'm pretty sure it's available on her website, as well as The Damn Diary, which is coming to you soon. This weekend only, I'll have some um, pre-orders available, and you'll get to download for free the reflection section of The Damn Diary, where you'll be able to... Uh, Go through the guided workbook section where you get to reflect on your daddy issues and what role you think and what impact you think they've had on your life. So again, thank you for joining us here in the discussion room. Have a great evening. Happy New Year. And I hope you all look forward to your new beginnings.